Hey everybody, my name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. I'm delighted to be here with all of you tonight, wherever you are watching from in the world. And also to have two special co-hosts tonight. This event is co-hosted by Outlanticon, which is Atlanta's LGBTQ plus convention for sci-fi, pop culture, multimedia, and gaming. Thank you so much to Outlanticon for being with us. They are having a 2022 con. And so I'm going to be dropping that info in the chat. You can go ahead and register now. We would love for you to participate in that because they are awesome. Um, this event is also co-hosted by Revolution Donuts. Revolution Donuts is our friendly neighborhood donut shop. And if you don't know why we might want a donut shop to co-sponsor this, you'll hear more. You'll figure it out once Rika starts sharing a bit about her book. Um, but everyone who is with us tonight is going to get a, a special coupon <coughs> for a free donut. Uh, that may not help you too much if you don't live near enough to receive a free donut. But if you know anyone in Atlanta, feel free to share your donut coupon with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the more the merrier. Um, so we are thrilled about this. We, we love um, Tor, which is a historic sci-fi, fantasy, speculative fiction press. We are delighted to have these folks together. Um, so I'm going to introduce Rika first. Rika's first novel, He Mele Ahilo, was published by Topside Press in 2014. She is a two-time Lambda Literary Award finalist for her collections, Seasonal Velocities, and Why Dust Shall Never Settle Upon the Soul. Rika's work has appeared or been recognized in publications including Vogue, Elle, Bustle, Autostraddle, Pop Sugar, and BuzzFeed, as well as the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Rika has been honored by the California State Senate for extraordinary commitment to the visibility and well-being of transgender people. She has an MFA in creative writing from Cornell University and is currently a professor of English at Santa Monica College. And the book we are here to celebrate with her tonight is Light from Uncommon Stars. <laughs> yes. Well, that was well. the right one. What is this? I don't know. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And, and she is joined by TJ Clune. TJ Clune is a New York Times and USA Today best selling Lambda Literary Award winning author of The House in the Cerulean Sea. The Extraordinaires, and more. Being queer himself, Kloon believes it is important now more than ever to have accurate, positive queer representation in stories. The book we are here to celebrate tonight is Under the Whispering Door, which just hit number four on the New York Times bestseller list yesterday. So that is a huge deal. Congratulations, TJ. We're really Thank happy you. for you and honestly, like happy for queer people everywhere. Um, and for folks watching at home, if you haven't ordered your book, we do still have a few signed copies of TJ's book, as well as special art postcards. So if you put in your order tonight, Ooh. while supplies last, we probably can get you one of those. So um, you can order your book at any time by clicking this teal button. It will take you to the page that has both of these folks' books. The last thing I will say is you. some of you have already gotten in on this <coughs> question asking game. Uh, which we're very delighted for. But go ahead and put your questions in the Ask a Question tab at the bottom center of the screen. Um, if you are on a phone or unable to do that, you can put your question in the chat and I'll move it over so that our authors can see it. All right, I know that we have a great, big, um, enthusiastic audience, so I'm going to get out of the way and uh, and let you all get right into it, because I know you have prepared some really fun questions for one another. So thanks so much for being here. We're really delighted. Gosh, thank you. Thank you, ER. That's so thank you, ER. Rika, Rika, guess what? What? Your your freaking book came out this week. Oh Holy my god. Crap. Oh Holy shit. Crap. Oh my god. So like yeah, yesterday I ended up going I mean on Tuesday I ended up going to um just just to, I went to bookstore to bookstore just to say, wait a minute, my book is here. Mm -hmm. Did you do the same thing? Yeah, with, oh, um, yeah. I go I go there and I'm like, I'm gonna be like a really cool Neil Gaiman and sign incognito. And then I get there and I'm like, hey, can you tell me where TJ Clune's books are, please? <laughs> so, and they're like, yeah, they're right over here. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna sign them. And they're like, who are you? Uh, I'm the author. 
then it's fun. <laughs> okay. I feel better. I feel better because it was like, ah, but um, there it was. And so, uh, so how, how has this week been for you? I mean, oh, you know what? Back up. Let me back up one second. How, cause what a lot of readers might not know is the length of time it takes between when a book is accepted for publication and when it actually comes out. It's a pretty long, it can be a pretty long time. It was months. Like, wait, yeah. Yeah. And so how has the wait for you been leading up to this week? It's been, it almost feels like this is just another step in the process. And I've been kind of mm -hmm. climbing and then I'm just realizing, wait a minute, um, you know, it's, it's done. We're, we're in bookstores. It's uh, because from editing, 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 and more editing to changes, and then all of the ARC stuff when the advanced copies come out and the changes mm -hmm. that are made there, um, it's been a little bit overwhelming. And, you know, all the time we're doing this, you know, our publicists are uh, making these arrangements. So, you know, we'll be appearing here and, and here and, and, and in this place. And it really feels, I guess what it feels like TJ is that I don't feel as exposed as I thought I would because I know I'm part of a really good team. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that I don't feel as, as vulnerable. I feel like everyone's, everyone's been playing their part exquisitely and all I need to do is do mine. And I didn't expect it. I expected it to be a little bit lonelier than it was. So I'm really mm -hmm. happy. And even I make such great friends like you. <clears throat> I mean, it's just, uh, so I didn't expect it to be so much fun and so social. It is because the writing side of things can be solitary. It can be lonely because when you're in those first, you know, months or however long it takes to write the first draft of your manuscript, you're pretty much on your own and you're pretty mm -hmm. much in your head with that. I don't, I don't know about you, but when I'm in the middle of a book, I am in that book. I'm thinking about it when I'm doing anything else, you know, and I, I always can't wait to get back to it if the story's going well. But then when you do put it out in the world, and it's it's something that I'm, I'm glad you brought up because I do want to highlight this again, is that we are not the only people who work on these books. We are not, we are not, it's our no. names on the title, it's on the covers and it's our words, but the, there are so many people who work behind the scenes that don't ever really get the credit that they deserve because they the reason we're here is because of our publicists the reason these books are out are because of marketing and editing and sales and everything that goes in between and i just think that it's so important that we remember that we are not alone when the book and, comes out it's a teamwork it's a team and i think also that uh when my first my first few books you know hemele ahilo and why does she, why does she'll never settle a lot of these books that came by a much smaller presses we really, you know, I was working very much alone. In fact, with Hemele Ahilo, I had to proofread my own book because oh, the, there was no sure. editors who could, speak, <laughs> who could speak pigeon. So I couldn't trust mm -hmm. them with the dialect. And so, um, and so there are errors and there are inconsistencies and shortcomings in, in the mm -hmm. book that a good editor, you know, like my editor, Lindsay, over at Tor would have caught and fixed and I think that sometimes for people who are publishing via small presses, they might be, you know, thinking, well, what's, you know, why is this here and why is that book there? And I think the more we let people know that there are editors involved, there are yeah. sensitivity readers, there are rewrites getting pushed back, and they push us hard. They mm -hmm. work and they make us look our absolute best. And I didn't have any of that coming up through the small presses. So it's really not, uh, sometimes it's not an equivalent comparison. It's not equivalent. There's a world of difference because I, I was like you, I was in with an indie publisher. Um, and, and they do just, great by the way, just not, not ripping on indie publishers at all, but it's just, resources. yeah, no, I, I will. Mine didn't do very good. <laughs> That's you know a story what? for another day. I have never it's... gotten a royalty check from my first novel either. But anyway, <laughs> let's just, let's just, I was just trying to be nice, but let's just go. Spill the tea. Ah! Spill the tea without naming names. But no, it's, it, it's a night and day difference between, between the, the indie publishing scene, which, you know, okay, let's say indie for one, there are so many great indie publishers out there. That, that's what I want to make clear. There are so many great indie publishers out there who are putting out important work. As a matter of fact, 
queer books were mostly indie for a very long time because yes. nobody wanted to publish them mainstream. Mm -hmm. So make sure we're absolutely clear on that. But at the same time, there is a difference because in terms of budget for like marketing, in terms of the 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 people that are working on the book, in terms of editing and what like that. And it's just, I feel, I feel like I'm in safer hands where yes. I with with where I am now. And that's not me <laughs> sucking up to my publisher, our publisher, who's undoubtedly watching in some way, shape, form, fashion. It's true. It's the absolute truth. And I think that we need to um remember that that we are not alone in the end no i mean when i who i mean when you saw your book when you, when you saw like your book cover mm -hmm. i mean what, how much of you how how surprised were you to see your book cover well okay so i, I have to, this i have to tell a little story so this book cover was done by chris sickles he works with red nose studios he also did the cover for the house in the cerulean sea mm -hmm. now when when they came to me with the cover idea for this first book, what the idea was, they basically sent me a little sketch. It was like that big, you know, it was a very rough sketch. It was just a pencil drawing of a house on, on like a jagged cliff and that, that was it. So I was thinking, how is this going to pop? You know, I was like, let's see what happens. Let's go ahead. And then when I got, I got this cover and keep in mind, I want to make sure everybody understands in case you haven't heard me talk about it a billion times over. These, these are built. Everything that you see in here is hand built. It's a set, the water, the sun, the cliff, the, the stag in the background, the trees, the house, all of this is hand built from the ground up by Chris. So when I got to see this cover again, I was like, I, I told my editor, you know what? I will never doubt anything you say ever again. Chris can work on my books for the rest of my life. And so when I got to see this one, I was I already knew that it was going to be something special. So but when I still saw it, it still blew me away. It still like absolutely blew me away. Mr. Rogers is a really queer neighborhood. Right, right. It is. <laughs> it's like Mr. Rogers and Tim Burton and Studio Ghibli were in a couple yes. relationship. Yes. And yes. then somehow yes. they were able to have children and that children was a house. Mm -hmm. I, whatever it's totally fine and it's um <clears throat> it's just it's so exciting because you know people you know let's let's admit it we can be cover snobs we absolutely can and you know when a cover is the first thing you see on a book on a shelf you know you want something that's going to be indicative of what's inside but you also want it to catch the person's eye who may be able to pick it up what about your cover how did you feel when you first saw that so look space, at this space koi so um space koi and i i mean when i was i had no clue how to do a freaking cover i mean just i have donuts i have spaceships you know it it's really you, you ask so, me how to do a cover i will give you, you know, draw like a full sentence outline that's not going to help <laughs> you know i didn't want a cover that looked like it was it, it was designed by a novelist you know mm -hmm. sorry so i told i told the uh you know, when I, when asked, I said, all I want is, you know, I, I want the artist to put some of their, I want part of the artist's soul. Who was the artist for? Jamie Stafford Hill. Awesome. Jamie Stafford Hill is awesome. And so anyway, this happened. And then when I, when I first saw this, I cried. Um, <sighs> I, I just looked at that and I said, wow. Um, that's metonymy if I ever saw it. I think every character kind of feels a little bit like this at a certain time and it's a powerful image and the colors are beautiful. And there's something else about this koi that people don't understand if they don't know koi. That's not a Japanese koi. That's actually, an, that's actually a koi that's an American koi with a slightly oh. longer fin. And some people who are koi snobs would look at this and go, that's not a real koi. And so it's actually a mixed race koi. And by the way, the koi is trans. I'm sorry, it's just, it is. So, you know, I was looking at this. Trans space koi for the win. Trans space koi for the win. And so I could never, never have come up with it, this image. And, you know, if Jamie's ever listening, it's when I saw it, I said, yeah, that there we are. And that goes back to your point, doesn't it, TJ? That we, we couldn't, have, it's not just us. No, it's absolutely not just us. So for people who might not know about your book and are here to learn about it, can you give, a, a, aside from me 
absolutely loving the book and having the honor to be on the cover with a blurb because I adore this book to pieces. Oh my gosh. Can you and tell? by the way, thank you for putting me on the back cover of your book. Oh yeah, for real, see that? For real, thank, thank you. you so much. For real. So tell us what, I mean, I honestly don't know how to describe <laughs> Light from Uncommon Stars in a way that would make sense that's not completely gushing. So why don't you do it? <laughs> well, Light from Uncommon Stars, it's all set in the San Gabriel Valley. And, you know, I really, uh, before I go into the San Gabriel Valley, I just want to say, I'm just going to I'm just going to digress. Sli I hope you don't mind, TJ. I just want to say it's Absolutely really, really not. nice to be at Karis. And even though I can't be there, I miss all of my Atlanta peeps. And I, I love you all, and I hope that to visit Aww. soon. No, see, what happened with the Atlanta crew is I performed in San Francisco early, early on, and they were the first – it, Atlanta was the first time I ever went on a writing road trip to perform mm -hmm. somewhere else and was just known uh, and, and, you know, and, and to be a writer. And so um, just really the, the, the people in Atlanta and the Atlanta community and uh, has always just kind of been like really close. I, I just felt so close. So I just want to say thank you to them. I've been to the Atlanta airport. Mm -hmm. You have to get out of the Atlanta airport sometimes and you have to maybe like go to the farmer's market because it's, it's a good place. I can do that. Okay. But anyway, so, you know, there it's, it's a bit about neighborhoods where, you know, we talk about places like flyover cities or a suburb and, you know, it's always somebody else's home. So mm -hmm. um, I really wanted to be, I really wanted to situate Light from Uncommon Stars in, in my home, the San Gabriel Valley. And I wanted to show that really cool stories can happen next door. Anyway, in the story, uh, it's, it's sent, we have one character. Her name is Shizuka Satomi. And she had been a brilliant violinist. But um, it, for some reason, she began to falter. And so she ended up selling her soul to hell. And being a very perceptive musician, she realized that's not what I wanted. And because of because of a glitch, which is in the book, she uh, has made a deal with hell that she will get her soul back by sacrificing the souls of seven others. And she's delivered six. This is not a nice lady. You know, she's she's already delivered six souls, and now she's looking for her seventh. Um, she also, because this is her last soul, she wants to make this something very, very special. And uh, so she comes to the San Gabriel Valley because she can sense there's something here. Uh, there's another character who, whose name is Katrina. And Katrina is a brilliant violinist, who young one, who, but who's pretty much of a wild talent. She, she's, a, she's trans. She's running away from home. She, she grew up kind of like east of Oakland. And she's running away from home. Her, her goal in life is to eventually set up a YouTube channel, monetize it, and play video game covers, and, and we're all good to go. Um, what ends up happening between the two of them is this is suddenly a student that Shizuka eventually runs, you know, eventually takes in, and it's like no other student that she's She's like no other student that she's ever taught. This is somebody who's not been privileged. This is somebody who's vulnerable. This is somebody who, in many ways, is a child in need of a parent. In need of a parent, and so the relationship they start to set up becomes this question of: Do I? Do I? Is my found family the the daughter that? You know this this person that I'm feeling this this child that I'm feeling parental to. Um, am I going to sacrifice this one for me? And it mm -hmm. kind of goes on from there. And also going on is there's Lan the Donut Lady. So Lan Tran <laughs> is, uh, Lan is, I, I really wanted, I really wanted Vietnamese space donuts. I really mm -hmm. said my next book must As have one should. Vietnamese space donuts. And um, she has brought her entire family across escaping a galactic war kind of, you know, and um, has landed in the San Gabriel Valley. And the reason she was able to escape is because she she told the government agencies, not that she was fleeing a war, but 
there's a good business opportunity there. I'm going to set up a donut shop. There's going to be a, there's going to be a gamma burst and we're going to make money because people are going to come here. They're going to buy donuts. It's going to be a great investment. So you just let us go. And so off they go and she escapes. Uh, I, I, I will say, and this is going to be me gushing again. So just get ready. I rarely get jealous when I'm reading another author's work, but I got jealous of your, <laughs> your prowess in this book and your, and the, the pros and just everything. Cause look, let's, let's be, let's face it. This book is, you know, and it's been called a mishmash of science fiction and fantasy that she, for that should not work in my head. That should not work, but it does. And it works beautifully. So okay. I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to Google stock you a little bit. So I asked, I found an interview that you did um, where you said, uh, I respect both science fiction and fantasy, but I had honest intentions and reason to mix them in light from uncommon stars. Mm -hmm. So what were your honest intentions? What did you well, want to do with this book? What I wanted to do with this book is to make a place, to make a statement that we can be whole. That, mm -hmm. you know, genre, we were talking about this in the green room. You know, genre, you know, there's no real reason why we have these different genres, except people have decided to say this is that certain genre. And um, I, when I am speaking with my family, I am no, I am not the person I am when I'm teaching English class. I am not the person teaching English class that I am uh, teaching queer trans youth self defense. And we all encompass so many different genres in our life, the genre of being a daughter, the genre of being a teacher, the genre of being analytical, the genre of being sympathetic. And as a, as, as a trans person who was so vested in trying to, and has been accused of not being genuine and who's been trying to find wholeness, I wanted to write a book that was almost like this endless security blanket over me that I could kick anywhere and I would still be under it. And uh, that's, and so I, th I thought, I wanna blend these different worlds and make it safe for anybody who reads it, that they can dream of violins, they can dry, dream of stars, they can dream of, de you know, they can dream of salvation, they can think of religion, they can think of dragons, Lindsay Sterling, they can have a donut. They don't have to leave the security blanket of the story. Mm -hmm. I gotcha, I gotcha. And that's good. So, work out. And I'm glad you said that, because um, there is a specific line in the book, and I've, I've already told you this line once before uh, because I adored it so much. It's from Miss Satomi and there's a line that reads, Katrina, in my business, one does not care about bodies. One is only concerned with souls. Mm -hmm. When I first read that line, I reread it a few times because it, it lands with a gut punch. And it is so deceptive that when you're get, you're starting the sentence, when you're starting those first few words, it feels like this, this quiet crescendo. But by the time you get one is only concerned with souls, it hits and it hits hard. So what does it mean to be a trans author writing trans characters in relation to the idea of body and soul? This is where it's really nice to be with Tor, and this is where it's really, really nice to be operating within the science fiction and fantasy world. There's uh, there are two things that are going on here that I feel you know. The first thing is we can devise a universe where gender doesn't matter and transness doesn't matter, and go towards it in a more utopian way. But at that time, we're no longer, I think, speaking to or speaking of the lived experience that so many of my friends, so many of my family have gone through. And that needs to me, I think that is also deserving of some, some mention and some sort of, uh, well, if I can, if I can sort of elevate them, we're good with that. The, uh, the idea is to present a lot of reality in our world and to make it seem, look, this is the this is where we are. You, you, as you are right now, you who might have done sex work or may still be doing sex work, you who maybe have uh, have had abuse in your past, you who uh, probably still can't go to the mall and go buy a dress because people you don't have the past privilege and people mm -hmm. look at you very, very, you know, very judgmentally. You get a story, too. 
Mm-hmm. And we don't have to wait for Star Trek. I'm going to give this to you. You don't even have to get out of your neighborhood. I'm going to fucking come to El Monte and I am going to tell you that you can have the stars. And I wanted to do this, you know, because so many of my friends are gone or they don't, you know, and, and I, I wanted to say, you know, your lives were good enough for so much. And it wasn't that we hadn't evolved to to a new society yet. It's that uh, you weren't treated right. And uh, that was cruel. And so I wanted to make sure that I wanted to make sure that that kind of experience was also put into the story. Oh, that gave me all the warm fuzzies. I enjoyed that immensely. Thank you for that answer. Because it's it, it is important, you know, that we that we get to see ourselves. We were talking about this in the green room that we get to see ourselves in media, not just fiction, but in in all forms, and and when and to show us not to be on a pedestal by any means, but to have us be flawed human people who who make mistakes and learn and grow from them, and get to have their own stories and get to have. The happy ending that that you know some people still don't think that we deserve. Which brings me to your book. I mean, so oh. <laughs> like, for, so what's going on here is like um, what I see so interesting about uh, your book is that you you have characters that so easily could have been written wrong. Mm-hmm. This this is the thing. I don't know what it's like to be a cisgender white man writing. Mm-hmm. I you know and. And that character, your, your lead character, could have so easily fallen into, you know, the trope of being, you know, the great white savior yep. or could have been all of these things. And um, especially when processing so much anger and so much strong emotion, you know, there's there's this entitlement to life. But mm-hmm. when you put white men and entitlement together, usually bad things happen. So my question is how much did you think about this and my goodness how did you write a character that me I, a trans woman of color could sympathize with and not feel uh threatened by it i knew going into this book that i would have to probably do the most work i have ever done on a book before because in, in case you don't know, Under the Whispering Door is about a white man named Wallace. He's the narrator, and he is a bastard. He is not a good person. And he dies in the very beginning of the book. And instead of going on to whatever comes next, he is taken to a tea shop where a man named Hugo awaits, who is the owner of the tea shop, but he's also the ferryman whose job it is to help um souls cross over to whatever comes next and wallace is the main character but he is the only white main character in the book we have um hugo the owner and his grandfather nelson both are black men and we have may who's a chinese american woman and this i knew going into it you know there's there's a lot of talk and rightfully so about the idea of tokenism where, where people are putting, they're basically slapping paint on a character and saying, I did my job, but that's not how it works. You, If you're going to do that, if you're going to write outside your lane, then you need to make sure that you're doing the work. You need to be doing the research. You need to be talking to people in the communities that you're writing about. And you, as you mentioned uh, briefly previously, sensitivity readers, man, they are the most, one of the most important parts of publishing because sensitivity readers are there to hold an author to account. They're not there to, to tear a book apart. They're there to make sure that the author is doing right about by these characters and not just <clears throat> slapping on paint or worse, approaching something like a white savior. And look, I'm going to be absolutely honest. There were moments in the very original manuscript where it kind of read like that a little bit. Wallace was a little too good at being a ghost and he was coming in and, and everybody was like, oh my gosh, look at Wallace. He's so good at all of this and blah, blah, blah. And it it is so humbling to be able to get to work with editors and sensitivity readers who can say this this needs to be fixed this is this is what it reads like this is what should be done we know the intent but the message is getting lost 
And so I was able to craft the character better than he had any right to be because of the input mm -hmm. that I received and because of people who read the book and said, this is what you're doing right. This is what needs to be fixed. And there have been, unfortunately, authors quite publicly coming out against sensitivity readers. And that is just the stupidest thing. <laughs> It's just the stupidest thing in the world, man. Look, I I have privilege because I'm a white, I'm a cis white dude. I have a privilege. Being queer does not equate my life to the experience of a person of color. And it is it is so important to to me that if I'm writing these characters of color, that I'm doing right by them and the community that is going to be reading these books. I don't want anyone to open the book and say, this is not good. We expect it better of you, TJ. Mm -hmm. And that's important to me because I have readers from all walks of life. And when I write about certain walks of life, I want to make sure that I'm doing it right by not only my readers and my, my team at Tor, but also to myself because I owe it to myself to get it right. Yeah, exactly. You know, with with mine, it was I had a really interesting experience. Well, first off, with sensitivity readers, here's the other thing too. I had a couple sensitivity readers run all people of color, all queer. You know, and so if you have if you're in a situation where they suggest a sensitivity reader, think about this: you're giving money from a big press to some queer person and it might be their first break too. So this is a very literal and direct way of taking money from there and putting it into our communities. And I think that sensitivity readers, uh, you know, I know we talk about how necessary they are, but you know, this is this to, to, to have a sensitivity reader being paid, that is a way to hustle the system because at mm -hmm. that point, suddenly that might pay somebody's rent and we need more, writers, more literary queer people paying their rent. Uh, the other thing that a sensitivity reader did, like in my case, I actually stayed away, TJ, from a lot of this, like uh, like Katrina turns out, it, Katrina's mixed race. And mm -hmm. I stayed away from a lot of the, the um, sort of the markers. I just let it go vague a little bit because I didn't feel entitled to write these things. And I got encouragement from my sensitivity reader, sensitivity reader saying, go right ahead, you know, do it. And here's some, here's some ways how to do it. And just that whole, that handholding, because I had come from a tradition where my stories had been spoken over so much. I didn't want to mm -hmm. speak over anybody else's yeah. story. So I'm not going to, I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm going to do mm -hmm. this and we're going to go. And, and it was my sensitivity reader in, in just those few interactions that we had saying, no, no, you should do more. And that was really, really nice to, that was, that was both affirmative for me, but I think it made the book so much better. It, it really made it feel that, you know, it took a little bit of the nervousness, I think, that could have been projected from having a narrator who was obviously steering clear of things. Yeah. And I, I just, I'm so happy to hear you say that because it's, it's such a, it's a, such a good thing to hear that, that, we are not only respecting who we're writing about, but we're also getting that feedback to make it better. And that, that just shows that, that shows the power of listening because we have to listen. We have to, if we're going to be doing stuff like this, we have to, because, you know, regardless of how many other people work on the books, like we discussed before, in the end, at the end of the day, it's still our names on the cover and it's our words that we wrote and therefore we the you know the buck stops here essentially so i i think that that sensitivity readers it just i can't sing their yeah i just i, I just, remember yeah. with your book when i first when we first ran into may mm -hmm. it's like okay mm -hmm. let's let's see what happens here and then sooner it's like okay we're good i still don't know how you did it but there was just this moment where it's like yeah well, thank you. Because a really damn good writer. We're just right <laughs> now. Thank you. Because well, look, <clears throat> Wallace, when he comes, when he first May, May is the first person that he meets. She is a reaper, and she's the one that comes to collect him. She's the first one he meets in this the, as a representative of this process of of coming over, and 
almost right away because that's the type of person he is, Wallace treats her like crap. He's a jerk. And immediately she calls him out for it. Immediately she tells him, look, <laughs> you're being a dick. Some of the shit you're saying is not okay. Think before you speak because I'm the only one who can see you. And to me, that was that not only was that a necessary moment that we could chop Wallace down to size, but it, it also empowered the character of May to know that she is not going to take crap from anyone. She's good at what she does. She is a wonderfully empathetic character. And, and just because she's dealing with this jerk doesn't mean she's going to, you know, let him, let him dish out to her because that's not, the, that's not how, who she is as a character. What I really loved about that, that, in the, that scene that you're talking about is you are establishing May's character as well. It wasn't May suddenly had to go into like white person mode. Mm -hmm. May called him out as May and you were mm -hmm. consistent. And it, it was at, around there. It's like, yeah, I, I know women like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, she's one of those. Okay. Got it. Okay. <laughs> we're not going to mess with her. Okay. <laughs> you know? I don't know. And, might, and she, might want to hit on her. Not going to mess with her. <laughs> every every character in in Under the Whispering Door has their own individual arc. Yes, Wallace is is the one at the forefront because the book is told from his point of view, and he has to go from his arc of redemption. But every character has an arc. Not that they needed to become better people or that Wallace was there to fix them. I think it's more they revealed layers of themselves as Wallace got to know them. So it wasn't like, oh, they're broken and here comes a white man and now he's coming to save us. It's more like, we're good at what we do and we'll be good even after you're gone. We've been good before, we'll be good during, we'll be gone, we'll be good after you're gone. And, but still at the same time, they do end up growing closer on the group of these people in this tea shop. And that's when they begin not necessarily needing Wallace to trust them, but them beginning to trust Wallace. And that's why they start to reveal their own depths and their own layers. And that was important to me because you can't have these important people teaching somebody or helping somebody, giving somebody the tools to try to become a better person. You can't have them be flat. You have to have their depth. They have to feel like real people. Even that's something that I always strive for. Even when I'm writing books about the fantastical, I want the characters to feel real. I want them to feel like you could walk out the door and meet these people. They talk like they're real. They they hurt, they laugh, they have joy like they're real people. I know they're not real, but they're real to me. And I wanna make sure that I honor them the best way I know how. And it's to show that they are so much stronger than Wallace first thinks because he, again, needed to be knocked down to size because he thought that he could bullshit his way through this and go back to his life, but that's not how it works. And just these these characters, Nelson and May and Hugo, and even Apollo, the ghost dog, all in some way contribute to, to showing Wallace what a life should be rather than having him show them, here, I can make your lives better. And I just, I'm just happy that <laughs> you thought that because it's scary. It can be scary because again, you have to acknowledge that privilege that I have that, that when writing characters uh, of color, it could go wrong if I'm not doing my due diligence. It can I go think, wrong very easily. And I've read books many times where that has gone wrong. I think that's why with, you know, with Light from Uncommon Stars too, another reason why, you know, I am threading so many characters is we're all the main character in our novel. And so mm -hmm. what I try to do is even with the characters that I'm not focusing on, it's not, I want to give the impression that it's not because this character that uh, these characters, Shizuka and, uh, you know, and Katrina and Lan are more important, but it's just where I happen to crop the wide angle lens. That mm -hmm. And so I like to have characters coming in where you think, wow, that's that's an interesting character. There's a side story there or it's not a side story. You know, it just happens to be this is where I'm focusing. So it's not about who's more important than the others. Just me as writer. This is who I happen to be focusing on that day. And I think that it's important because 
um, especially in terms of people of color. Uh, we don't get in 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 classic, uh, you know, not in class, but in in a lot of older books, a lot of older movies. We were put in very two dimensional uh, roles, supporting roles, servers, and that were so, that many of which were downright racist. <laughs> Very much so. That there's a reason in the book that I make, you know, one of the white characters Astrid a domestic, because mm -hmm. I get to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and the, and actually with Astrid, I actually don't really talk too much. About, I, I hint at her past, but I don't really talk too much about it. And that's part of the reason because how many seasons of Bonanza, Bonanza and how how much do you know about Hopley, <laughs> or you know whatever you see? So mm -hmm. you know. I wanted that to be a tradition. I wanted to, for once, show what readers tr have been missing by not including these stories, by not, by by only talking at the donut people and not speaking with the donut people. So it's we're we're going to be getting to questions in in a couple of minutes. So make sure you're putting your questions in the ask a question box. But oh I my did, gosh, there's I did. a lot. Yeah, I did want to ask one question though, because I'm always fascinated by um, music in books and how it plays a part. So, in in Life from Uncommon Stars, uh, music plays a big part of the book, and it can be difficult to translate musicality to prose. But you prove to be absolutely more adept at it. Can you talk about the music aspect of the book and and how it relates to the novel with with like with an instrument if it's if it's out of tune, one can tell almost immediately. And I think the same could arguably be said about a soul, mm -hmm. which brings about the idea of um, sympathetic resonance. So mm -hmm. if you could talk about the musicality of the book and, and what you wanted to achieve by including that. Well, I, I actually cheated. <laughs> 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 what I ended up doing, I actually, you know, I actually have, in addition, you know, I know poets, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of very good poets, and I, I've read with some amazing poets. Some of them are watching, you know, are watching right now. Karen G's out there at this moment, you know. If you can, let's see, you know, and just like it was, it, listening to so many great poets and hearing the music gave me a lot of confidence to be able to, you know, you listen to some like Saul Williams or something, you know, and suddenly you, you can start hearing that. And so when I was rendering the music, I wasn't just reacting to the music. I haven't told anybody this. I was freestyling to the music. I was slamming to the music. That's awesome. And, and so what I was doing, and I wrote that, entire, I wrote some of the pieces towards the end where I'm mm -hmm. channeling the music. I'm writing that in real time. So I have the Victoria Molova track playing Bartok at the end. I don't want to go mm -hmm. too much into that. I'm playing and I am freestyling over it. And then I, get, I have all of this and I bring it and I just make it pretty. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I make it, uh, I form it. But uh, I think poets who are novelists, have a little bit sometimes we have this little extra gear when it comes to about mm -hmm. things like writing about music or trying to like draw a character in three strokes we kind of know how to do that that's what we do so um this is one of those situations where um you know um i couldn't have uh i couldn't have done this without all the training and all the role models and all the amazing <laughs> poets that i've been associated with do you think in music in music, do you th or do you think in words? Hmm. Closer to music, I think. Yeah, I, I really. I figured that would be because I, I've I've asked that to poets before, and I always get the response. Yeah, it's more well, music. The funniest thing about it is, you know, they they talk about people have an internal monologue. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk to themselves. Where do you stand on that? Do you have an internal monologue that's like sounding like Jean Luc oh, Picard? Yeah. Oh no, I have. I have. Um, many, many internal monologues all going on at once. And that's just how my brain works. And wow, it's wow, like a storm in my head constantly. But as I've gotten older, it's easier to sift through. And so I can I can latch on to certain words or phrases that go flying by and discard others, but I still hear them in my head as it's going by. Well, I don't have that. I, mm. I, hear, I, I hear things, I hear music, and I, I, I hear 
did I do? Yeah, I hear color. It's the weirdest thing. And then when I uh, when it's time to face the page, I let myself go. And in some ways, it's almost like automatic writing. I know what I want to say, mm -hmm. but I don't know what the words are going to be. And <laughs> and so there's always this moment of of having to like um, submit to, to sort of like submit your thoughts and go, I have no idea. Let's just going to let let's go ahead and see what happens later. The editor comes out and then we 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 do what we need to do. But the initial part of of my writing process is I have this feeling. Here's the pen. Go. That's awesome. OK, let's go to questions. I've got them here. Um, oh, yay. Melanie would like to know, how would you describe the feeling of finishing a book? Rika, if you want to answer that first. Wow. Um, so you know, what do we mean by finishing a book? Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of times it's not, I think I had two times where I really thought I finished the book. The first was the, the handwritten manuscript where I wrote the end and I was done. Um, by the way, my, my book was written in longhand. I, I write with a fountain pen oh, and, Lord. uh, I know this. My next one, no, we're, we're 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 using this, and no, we're not doing that anymore. But I wrote the end, and we were done. And but I knew that there was this that that there was a longer process. When I turned in the manuscript to uh, my editor for the first time, I didn't feel I finished because I knew we had plenty to do. Even when I saw this, I didn't feel I finished the book. Mm -hmm. This is the book. When I felt I finished the book is when I got a review in Amazing Stories. And the review came out and I was in Amazing Freaking Stories, the oldest yeah. science journal, the oldest science publication, science fiction mm -hmm. publication in the freaking, on the freaking planet. And mm -hmm. I remember when I was younger and I would just have these little things, you know, these, I would put them in my parents' shopping cart and they would know and take them out immediately. But I tried and, um, and sudden, and I remember just thinking how wonderful it would be to be a writer like that. And suddenly there I was on the site and they were recommending Light from Uncommon Stars. That's when I knew I was finished. That's and, awesome. And at that time, what I, it feels like, uh, you know, the day after your taxes are done. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and, and everything's in and you can just go to the beach and just have a nice and just relax because it's all done. It's yeah. like that only more. That's how it feels. It feels like, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then later on the insecurities come in, but <laughs> come it's right, right, right back. <laughs> but there's this moment where it's like, everything's quiet now, just for a bit. Everything's quiet. Is it like that for you, TJ? No. Um, when I finish a book, mm -hmm. I am at once relieved and devastated because I know that the story is over for me, at least at that point, you know, because I know that we're going to get to editing and things will change and more will come. Oh my stuff gosh, so cool. Up, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I... Um, consider my story finished when, when I send it in to the publisher. And when I, I, what I love, we talked earlier about the space between when a book is done and when it actually comes out. What I love about traditional publishing is the time that that is between even the starting process, like under the whispering door was written in 2018, 2019. So, you know, when it came to the editing process, I'd already had distance between myself and the book. So I was able to look at it objectively. And when I got the edits, the first time of edit to say, okay, yeah, this doesn't work at all. Absolutely doesn't work. We need to change this and this and this. And it, it feels like at that point that I'm not building the story more, but I'm just patching up my, my, <laughs> my mistakes and the, the holes that I made. And it, it just makes it in complete form. But for me, I, I, I consider it finished when I no longer want to look at it anymore <laughs> because that happens by the time you're done with edits, you're like, Oh yeah, this freaking book. Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's get this done and out of the way. Screw this book. <laughs> you know, I think that's where the poet still comes in me because when I'm editing and I'm catching that word and I'm feeling that word is right, it makes the sentence better. Mm -hmm. I, I get the joy that I feel completing a line in poetry. So I find the editing part is a lot. I find a lot of discovery in the editing process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Next question, and we'll try to move through these. Yes, well, let's okay, try. Got, okay, read any good queer books lately? Yes, uh, The Life of Uncommon Stars. Yeah, also, that was easy. Freya Marsk yeah. has a book coming out in November called The Marvelous Light, which is so good. It is sexy. It's a book about magicians, a queer magician, and his new assistant, who's just a adorable goofball. And I am so excited for that book. That comes out in November. And I just want to highlight another book. Um, uh, I got the privilege to read Anne-Marie McLemore's uh, uh, novel that comes out next year called Lake Lore about two trans boys, one with ADHD and one with dyslexia. And it is, um, it, it is, I had a similar feeling after I finished reading A Marvelous Light. It was just, it, it made, or uh, A Light from Uncommon Stars. It just made me happy. It just made me, and and God, are are they, they use they, them pronouns, are they a phenomenal writer? So that comes out at some point next year. I don't know about the date. What about you? Well, I have two. Uh, one is uh, who I just mentioned before, Winter's, or uh, Winter's Orbit, Everina Maxwell's book, because it's just such a fun read. It's really mm -hmm. just, and it's, it's actually- Space gaze. Space gaze. Mm -hmm. And it's like sleek, shiny space, smooth space gaze. And suddenly you're getting all hot and bothered by all of the, and there's such derps. I mean, there's so, it's no. such a derpy <laughs> romance. It's, it's like, what you got? You know, ah! you know, and so it's so much fun, but also the world building's amazing. The idea of galactic versus interstellar. Mm -hmm. It, you know, Everina does a spectacular job with that book and it just goes down so easy. And it's also really, it's another book where people are just nice to each other. And so there's none of this, this uh, gratuitous cruelty. And, you know, Everina is another, another writer, I think, who really, um, I really feel in good hands when I read Everina's work, you know. Another one, though, in some ways that also reminds me of TJ's book is because TJ works in, you know, the cool thing about Under the Whispering Door is like, one thing about this book that you shouldn't understand is like, it's such a cool way. It's such an interesting, the story of anger and processing mm -hmm. anger is so, is so beautifully done in this book. Oh, another book where, you, another, another book that reminds me of that, but handles anger in a different way, but does it so artistically is Shelley Parker Chan, She Who Became the Sun. Yeah. Yeah. That is a fantastic book That's too. That's a fantastic book. And and this idea, and then we have people who are, um, you know, all sorts of gender play going on. A lot of people are in between uh, gender and definitions. And that one is set in sort of like, uh, you know, sort of mythological old China. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's got a lot of the wuxia uh, kind of mentality. It's like, so it's basically like watching a queer kung fu movie with general <laughs> and, and really hot sex <laughs> that is awesome um i think you already answered this one but you can tell people about it if you want it's question for both of you if that's okay what is and this is from rachel what is the name of your book playlist and what are some of the songs that go with your books yeah so i just kind of like threw a, a link in there but why don't you go mm -hmm. first well <laughs> my there is a playlist coming and it'll be released on the tour spotify account next month because we want it's i don't want to say it's spoilery but it does well, let's give, not deal with that yeah yeah it does give um there is a narrative order to the songs i selected for the playlist so we will put that out yeah. next month and after mine just, my out. playlist just came out from large heart boy you know tor is going to ask me to do a playlist but i ended up telling everybody who my favorite donut authors are and you're a donut too no <laughs> 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 so that, that's a good question for the next one it says cecile what is your favorite drink and dessert pairing tea and donut or otherwise <sighs> tea for me and Oh man, if I could have anything in the world right now, it would be peanut butter chocolate chip cookies to go along with that. Like a really good black tea and a chocolate peanut butter cookie because I am, look, I'm sorry if there are children watching right now, but I am a slut for peanut butter and chocolate going together. <laughs> really? I, I, I will firsthand admit it. I try to eat healthy, but if you put Reese's peanut butter cups anywhere near me, I will find them. I will make a mess of myself and I'll be embarrassed, but I will eat the crap out of them. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. That is my jam. Wow. So what about you? Favorite drink and dessert pairing? Wow. So my favorite, I mean, my favorite drink and dessert, it's like, there's, I just like very, very simple girl, passion fruit, iced tea and a beauty. And, and I love lemon bars. I just, oh, I, I, I love lemon bars. I love lemon mm -hmm. pie. I love these things. And just like with that, with a nice, like an, an Arnold Palmer or a nice iced tea. And, and we're, we're quite pleased and, and we're good with that. And so, you know, all of these donuts and everything are expecting me to say donut and I love donuts, yeah. but I, I don't think of donuts as dessert. I think of them as main dish. They're on track. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I have agreed with everything that you've said. I have championed you in your book, but that is <laughs> blasphemy. How is that a main dish? Have you ever made a donut sandwich where you cut like a donut? Never mind. No, <laughs> no, you can't do that. Like, I, I follow these Instagram accounts where there's like, oh, let's see what kind of gross food we can make. And then they have like donut hamburgers. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> well, well I, I shall respect those boundaries. And we will just... <laughs> but you didn't say the safe word, TJ. No, just kidding. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on. Mm -hmm. um, Casey, I hope I'm saying that right. How would the characters in both your books interact with each other? Oh, crap. Um, well, Wallace would throw up his hands and be like, what the hell is this now? Stargates? <laughs> Faustian bargains with the devil? Mm -hmm. There's more? <laughs> yeah. That's That would be Wallace's immediate reaction. He would be very dismayed to find out that there's much more even beyond what he knows already. I am just thinking how uncomfortable that, that table would be with Shizuka and Hugo. Yeah. <laughs> they would just oh. sit that would be cool. Yeah. Somebody write that fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody write that. But I really but think I, I, yeah, I can't Katrina read it, and Apollo, sorry. I would love to see them get to just kind of hang out. <gasps> Yay! That would be yeah. a good one. I'd be totally okay with that one too. That would be amazing. <laughs> For TJ from Maddie, will there be another book in the house in this really insane world? Um, I've said this before, and I'm going to be diplomatic as possible about this when I say I'm not ready to discuss anything as of yet, but I will say, um, full disclosure that if I do write a sequel to that book, it would be because I thought there was another story to tell in that world. It would not be because that book was is popular and it would be easy cash grab kind of thing to do because that's not the type of person I am. That's not the type of author I am and I never want to be that author. So if I can find a story that, that can stand on its own but can also stand with the first that wouldn't dilute any of the wonderful messages in the first book, then maybe, yeah, I'd consider it. Um, but right now I'm just, I don't know that I've gotten there yet, but never say never. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, Christine, which of the characters from both of your books do you think could be friends? <laughs> I'd love a world where Wallace and Hugo listen to Katrina's music and hang out with Shizuka. Oh. Yeah, we just said, yeah, that's absolutely. I absolutely think that they would absolutely be friends. Tea and donuts work. Yeah, they absolutely they work absolutely as, do. as a dessert. <laughs> And I'm, as a dessert, okay, a dessert. we're working we're, 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 we're that. Yeah. Uh, um, I facilitate a queer book club at my library. Do you have any suggestions for our December read? It needs to be said at least a year, it needs to be at least a year old for interlibrary loans or we'd be reading Light from Uncommon Stars. Oh, geez. Um, hmm. Julian Winters is a, is a wonderful YA author who, who I, I wish would find the biggest audience in the entire world. He is a BIPOC author, queer author, and he writes the the most wonderful BIPOC stories, uh, queer love stories that uh, how to be Remy Cameron, Remy Cameron uh, running with lions, all of this. I, I, I knew him before he was a published writer and, um, and he just the, the, and, let me put it this way too. Julian is a friend of mine, but he is also one of the most genuine people I have ever met in my entire life. And not only is he a gifted author, but he is such a cheerleader for the uh, other authors in the YA community. And I think that we are all better off because he, um, thank you ER for putting, yeah, there's Julian's books in the chats, the link. We are all better off that he exists and he is telling us, um, 
his stories. And I'm so proud of the work he has done. And I can't wait to see where he goes in the future. Mm -hmm. What about you? Is there any, any um, queer books well, I, that, that I was thinking, out? Oh, this was here. I guess mine is like revolves around music for me on this one here. So um, re a book that revolves around music, I would, I would suggest that you get a manga. Uh, the manga that I would suggest that you get is called your lie in April. And this is a book about a piano prodigy and a violin prodigy and trying to discover themselves. They deal with a lot of child abuse, but it all, and, and self-discovery and the meaning of music. And it's, one of the saddest and yet one of the most beautiful things that I've ever read. It's out in English right now. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I would suggest either if you're a library to get the, get the English version, or maybe you can get a DVD, but it's your lie in April. And um, also if you can get the soundtrack or listen to it, the, uh, the music is, is stellar and, and just the feelings are stellar. So uh, here I am trying to foster a more global readership. That's awesome. That's perfect. Um, uh, this question is about, this is from Anna. This question is about flash fire because I haven't been able to ask it. So have you ever th thought about making a kind of spin off about jazz and Gibby? No. And the reason is, is because um, this is from my extraordinary series. The first book came out last year. The second book came out this summer. The third book comes out next year. Um, I consider Jazz and Gibby and Seth and Nikki to be part of a whole. And, and um, their story is the, the last book that comes out next year is the final story with those characters. I, I leave them in a place where I am certain of their future and their happiness and their joy, not only with themselves and with their romantic relationships, but with their friend group. And these characters, you know, I, I don't, you, you know, some people will say it's not very realistic that you find the love of your life in when you're in high school. And maybe that's true, but it happens. And I'm not even talking about romantic love of your life. I'm talking about the friends, the loves of your life that are your friends. But these four I have made sure that these four will stick together through thick and thin. They may argue, they may give each other shit, but in the end, they are a team both in the superhero world and out. And so I, I think that any kind of spinning off will kind of not really go forward with what I want to do with these characters. Um, okay. Miriasha, I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, for both of you, how does writing for a general audience affect the writing you feel able to write and get published and or marketed? Are there dream projects you have in mind if you could write whatever you possibly wanted? And I'll keep my answer short because I want to hear Rika's answer. I write what I want. And if, if that's just how it is. Yes, again, we talked about editing and whatnot and how that input, but I don't write for an audience. I write the stories I want to tell. And if people want to read those books, hooray, that's wonderful. And if not, that's okay too. But I don't write for people. I write for myself. Mm. I remember the first time I read uh, as the first, you know, the first time I ever was out in public as Rika, you know, before, you know, my first mm -hmm. public time was actually on stage at a poetry event called Forward Girls. I actually, Aww. and here I was this, person who is still having to shave mm -hmm. and all of this stuff going on and thinking what's going on and I read my work and people liked it and they clapped and I realized whoa this is nice being me <laughs> <laughs> this is really nice and I never wanted to sacrifice that so mm -hmm. every time I, I write now I feel like I'm stage diving a little bit I'm just hoping but you know I'm not going to compromise I'm going to write what I want and We'll see what happens. I, you know, look, I'm writing a story about space aliens, violin players. There's like trans folk, there's you know, alien life forms. There's, you know, very few people here are white and they're, and they're in the San Gabriel Valley and I'm bringing up Bartok and I'm expecting to sell this. Mm -hmm. um, what I found is editors and, uh, you know, are looking for, good books and i've never really felt that uh during this whole time i never once felt somebody said maybe you shouldn't write that it might be maybe you could write it better mm -hmm. but it's never been that so um i've i've really feel that your best bet as a writer is to 
everything that's given me success has been all my weird, my weird idiosyncrasies that have caused me to um, be, be, I guess, horrible in relationships. But apparently, I'm really good on paper. So, uh, <laughs> so, 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 uh, so it's you know, it's those things that you think make you odd. Those mm -hmm. are the things that I think that if you're true to them, you know, don't give yourself, you know, don't, don't credit yourself so much. There's other people who need to hear that too. Right. And so one last thing on that question, and we got a couple more we can get through quick, but mm -hmm. um, I do want to say to anybody out there who wants to be a writer, who is writing and is thinking about the types of stories they want to tell, don't write for other people because if you write for other people, okay, no, no book will be beloved by everyone. Absolutely not. The, your favorite book, I've said this before, your favorite book in the entire world, go on to Goodreads and look at the one star reviews of that book and see that people do not like that book. That's how it is. You will never, ever, ever please anyone. <laughs> Everyone, anyone. I got some advice when I was first starting out. Somebody told me you will there will be people who love your book. There will be people who like your book. There will be people who hate your book. Write for yourself because you'll never make any of them completely happy. So just write for yourself. Write the stories that you want to read. Write the stories that you wish you could read. Um, Jen has a question. I'm always curious who gets selected to read your book's audio. How much input do either of you have? By the way, I'm really enjoying Cindy Kay's reading of Light from Uncommon Stars. Gosh, Cindy Kay's amazing, huh? So mm -hmm. uh, what ended up happening for me is this was all new to me and um, we were, I was, you know, given by, by somebody at Macmillan who was in charge of this, a list of sort of different sound files of different readers who were reading a sample of my book. And um, what I was trying to do, I had a sort of a set idea of the kind of voice that I wanted. And it's really interesting to hear your words written, read by different types of actors, uh, mm -hmm. boy, you know, readers, because they will be younger, energetic ones, there'll be slower, softer ones, you know, there will be, there will be people who read, you know, more like, you know, poets, there'll be people who read like Garrison Keillor before, you know, there's just all kinds of things. So you, you have a choice of a few and, and you're, it's fine to say no. You know, you can continue and work. Eventually, what Tor gave me was final yes or no, and uh, Cindy read. And then what, en what ends up happening is after we figure, okay, this we're going to be working with Cindy, I was asked to go over names and place names and all of that to make sure that we got the local pronunciation right. And after that, it was just all to the races. Um, I really respect the people who do these audiobooks it's uh, mm -hmm. it's they really um, i don't know how they do it but it's it's amazing cindy did an amazing job i am got very lucky i've been very lucky for many many years with my audiobooks that i have the narrators that i worked with cuz my the couple of my narrators i've worked with over many books and you will know them from um, the extraordinary series which i was able to bring michael leslie up to Tortin, and I wrote the books with him in mind because he is that kind of comedic um, performance that I, I thought that that book needed. So Tor was like, Tortin was like, heck yeah, we'll bring him on after I told him about what he could do. Um, Daniel Henning did uh, House in the Cerulean Sea, and he was uh, 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 suggested by the Macmillan audio department. And I I heard his audition for a minute and I said, absolutely. He, I, I know who this person is now with these types of voices. So heck yeah, I'm going to do that. And Kurt Graves is somebody I've worked with for many years and you know, he yeah. just did under the whispering door. And wow. I am, am so happy that he was able to um, come up with us too, because he is those characters. Okay. One last question mm -hmm. we'll do. This is from Alice. What's your favorite food you mentioned in your book? Hmm. Let's see. For me, uh, so um, my favorite food is actually the set of at the noodle house at Kim Ki with the noodles, with the kidneys and the chives. Um, I know I actually like the duck 
a lot and I like the Hainan chip, but I've had them recently. I haven't had the noodles since before the pandemic. So that's what I'm craving right now. So mm -hmm. it's these, yeah, it's these rice noodles and this beautiful broth and they have these braised kidneys and and they, they, there's chives in them and they put some, some ginger and it's, um, you're in heaven. Yeah, it sounds like that. <laughs> and, it smell, and when they bring it out, everybody in the restaurant knows what you order because the smell is just coming out. And, mm -hmm. um, and you realize that you're going to, you're going to eat all of this and it's going to be under $15. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. My, I think that I, I'm more focused on the tea in my book. And I, I tried every type of tea that was consumed in this book because <laughs> I wanted to make sure that I got the taste right when describing the taste. I wanted to make sure I understood what I was drinking. And um, that's why I learned to play violin. Yeah. And so, yeah, same thing. Same exact thing completely. Absolutely. Yeah. We're so talented. Jesus. <laughs> but it was, I, I, I enjoyed almost every single one of the teas that I uh, tried, except for one, which was Alan's tea that he drank, uh, the Kuding Cha. Uh, mm -hmm, yeah, that, one. that it, you know, there, there, as Hugo describes in the book, there is an after note of honey that comes along with it. But to get to that after note, man, it just, <laughs> it feels like you are eating your lawn and it is hardcore. It is hardcore. So that one, I was kind of like, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe not so much. <laughs> but every all the other teas, I, I absolutely enjoy because like uh, peanut butter and chocolate, I'm a slut for tea. And that's how I go. That's how I wow. am. That's how I do. You wanna, Yeah, it's mm. one of those confessions I have to make. I almost feel like I have to turn in my Asian card. I'm not that big a fan of hot tea. Oh, my God. I'm not a big, I'm, I do not like cold tea. I do not like iced tea. Wow. Well, I'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. You know what? what? With our powers combined, we're almost yes. a whole person. Almost. Let's <laughs> keep very taste. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think all we need is like maybe a Western or something. Somebody needs to write a Western. Absolutely. Yeah, we, yeah we'll just, we'll write yeah. the Western. Hell, there we go. Yeah, that's, everybody. that's what we're going to do. <laughs> okay, ER, if you want to pop back mm -hmm. on, thank you so much for Thank you, everyone. Everything. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This ER. has been a blast and wonderful. It and I been. am so happy to be here making sure that everyone in the world reads A Light from Uncommon Stars. Yes, um, and Under the Whispering Door. So- um, Oh yeah, that too. <laughs> if y'all are- New Times bestseller, go do yes. it. Uh, and, and so deservedly so. Absolutely, so if you want to contribute to that bestselling trend, we would like for you to click the steal button at the bottom center of the screen. Um, you can get both of these authors' amazing books. We do have um, signed copies of TJ's book, and it comes with a little special card. So we would love for you to take advantage of that. Um, we'd also love for you to claim your free donut. So um, <laughs> drop the code a couple times. I'll do it one more time. Uh, thank you to our sponsors of tonight's event, Revolution Donuts and Outlanticon. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, we're, we're so glad to be <laughs> So <have> awesome. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, again, thank you both so much. It's, we were talking in the green room about the importance of, of fun queer books and, um, you know, fun queer books that have hard things in them, but, but are fundamentally fun and for us and by us. And, and certainly both of these books are that. And I, I am really grateful that, that younger people coming up today, but really anyone, you know, of any age has access to these things. Um, because we don't just have to have sad melodrama um, no. as our option, you know. Um, no, so. it's, it's not our job to be, to teach them, to teach a lesson to some cis straight white person and help them be a better person. You know, exactly. basic, pardon my language, fuck them. What's our story? Co-signed. Exactly. So thank you both so much for the work thank you. that you do. Um, congratulations on your success. And um, I look forward to, to future things and, and perhaps uh, getting together in person. Uh, yeah. and, and Absolutely. I miss Atlanta. I'll be there soon. Whenever it's, and Karis, thank you very, very much. And, you know. Yes. Thank you, Karis, for being thank here. You, and, you know, Rika, thank you for being a person that I adore. Oh, and back at you. And you know what? We did all of this and we didn't even talk about, we didn't even play Star Trek, which we're going to do later. Okay, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> Take care. Good night, y'all. Bye. You. Bye.